Oh, uh, hiya dolls. It's just me, Moidal here. Um, just going to pull myself, you know, a little bubbly. And um, like, like ladies do. And, you know, just got a cup here. Like, you know, I'm, I, I might be living in in Valley of the Ashes, but I'm on my, I'm on my way up. I'm telling you right now. Okay. Um, cheers. Mmm. <laughs> Delicious stuff. All right. Let's pick up where we left off. Get some chairs, why don't ya? So somebody can sit down. Oh, sure, agreed Wilson hurriedly. I went toward the little office, mingling immediately with the cement color of the walls. A white ashen dust veiled his dark suit and his pale hair as it veiled everything in the vicinity, except his wife, who moved close to Tom. I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right. I'll meet you by the newsstand on the lower level. She nodded and moved away from him, just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. We waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July and a gray, scrawny Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad track. Terrible place, isn't it? Said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Ackelberg. Awful. It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? Wilson? He thinks she's, he thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb, he doesn't know he's alive. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York, or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Tom deferred that much to the sensibilities of those East Eggers who might be on the train. She had tra changed her dress to a brown figured muslin, which stretched tight over her rather wide hips as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At the newsstand, she bought a copy of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the station drugstore, some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. Upstairs in the solemn, solemn echoing drive, she let four taxi cabs drive away before she selected a new one lavender colored with gray upholstery. And in this, we slid out from the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. But, Im but immediately she turned sharply from the window and leaning forward, tapped on the glass. Dunk, dunk, dunk. Uh, I wanna get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I wanna get one for the apartment. They're nice to have, you know, a dog. We backed up to a gray old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket swung from his neck cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. What kind are they? Asked Mrs. Wilson eagerly as he came to the taxi window. All kinds. What kind do you want, lady? Uh, I'd like to get one of those police dogs. I don't suppose you got that kind. The man peered doubtfully into the basket plunged in his hand and drew one up, wriggling by the back of the neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with disappointment in his voice. It's more of an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown wash rag of a back. Look at that coat, some coat. That's a dog that'll never bother you with catching cold. Oh, I think it's cute said Mrs. Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? That dog? He looked at it admiringly. That dog will cost you $10. The Airedale, undoubtedly there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were startlingly white, changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof coat with, rap with rapture. Is it a boy or a girl? She asked delicately. That dog, that dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Here's your money. Go buy 10 more dogs with it. We drove over to Fifth Avenue, so warm and soft, almost pastoral, on the summer Sunday afternoon that I wouldn't have been surprised to see a great flock of white sheep turn the corner. Hold on, I said, I have to leave you here. 
Nope, you don't. Interspose Tom quickly. Myrtle will be hurt if you don't come up to the apartment. Won't you, Myrtle? Come on, she urged. I'll telephone my sister Catherine. She said to be very beautiful by people who ought to know. Well, I'd like to, but we went on, cutting back again over the park toward the West Hundreds. At 158th Street, the cab stopped at one slice in a long white cake of apartment houses. Throwing a regal homecoming glance around the neighborhood, Mrs. Wilson gathered up her dog and her other purchases and went haughtily in. I'm going to have the McKees come up, she announced as we rose in the elevator. And of course, I got to call up my sister too. Okay, so pay attention to how this, this apartment is described. And in particular, think about the Buchanan Mansion versus Myrtle and Tom's love nest apartment, okay? The apartment was on the top floor, a small living room, a small dining room, a small bedroom and a bath. The living room was crowded to the doors with a set of tapestried furniture entirely too large for it. So that to move about was to stumble continually over scenes of ladies swinging in the gardens of Versailles. The only picture was an over enlarged photograph, apparently a hen sitting on a blurred rock. Looking at from a distance, however, the hen resolved itself into a bonnet and the countenance of a stout old lady beamed down into the room. Several old copies of Town Tattle lay on the table together with a copy of Simon Call Peter and some of the small scandal magazines of Broadway. Mrs. Wilson was first concerned with a dog. A reluctant elevator boy went for a box full of straw and some milk, to which he added on his own initiative a tin of large, hard dog biscuits one of which decomposed apathetically in the saucer of milk all afternoon. Meanwhile, Tom brought out a bottle of whiskey from a locked bureau door. I have been drunk just twice in my life, and the second time was that afternoon, so everything that happened has a dim, hazy cast over it. Although until after eight o'clock, the apartment was full of cheerful sun. Sitting on Tom's lap, Mrs. Wilson called up several people on the telephone. Then there were no cigarettes and I went out to buy some at the drugstore in the corner. When I came back, they had disappeared. So I sat down discreetly in the living room and read a chapter of Simon called Peter. Either it was terrible stuff or the whiskey distorted things because it didn't make any sense to me. Just as Tom and Myrtle, after the first drink, Mrs. Wilson and I called each other by our first names, reappeared, company commenced to arrive at the apartment door. The sister, Catherine, was a slender, worldly girl of about 30 with a solid, sticky bob of red hair and a complexion powdered milky white. Her eyebrows had been plucked and then drawn on again at a more rakish angle, but the efforts of nature toward the restoration of the old alignment gave a blurred air to her face. When she moved about, there was an incessant clicking as innumerable pottery bracelets jingled up and down upon her arms. She came in with such a proprietary haste and looked around so possessively at the furniture that I wondered if she lived there. But when I asked her, she laughed immoderately. <laughs> Repeated my question aloud, do I live here? <laughs> and told me she lived with a girlfriend at a hotel. Mr. McKee was a pale, feminine man from the flat below. He had just shaved for there was a white spot of lather, lather on his cheekbone. And he was the most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the room. He informed me that he was in the artistic game and I gathered later that he was a photographer and had made the dim enlargement of Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like an ectoplasm on the wall. His wife was shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible. She told me with pride that her husband had photographed her 127 times since they had been married. Mrs. Wilson had changed her costume some time before and was now attired in an elaborate afternoon dress of cream-colored chiffon which gave out a continual rustle as she swept about the room. With the influence of the dress, her personality had also undergone a change. The intense vitality that had been so remarkable in the garage was converted into impressive hauteur. Her laughter, her gestures, her assertions became more violently affected moment by moment. And as she expanded, the room grew smaller around her until she seemed to be revolving in a noisy, creaking pivot through the smoky air. My dear, 
she told her sister in a high, mincing shout. Most of these fellas will cheat you every time. All they think of is money. I had a woman up here last week to look at my feet. And when she gave me the bill, you'd have thought she had my appendicitis out. What was the name of the woman? Asked Mrs. McKee. Mrs. Aberhart. She goes around looking at people's feet in their own homes. I like your dress, remarked Mrs. McKee. I think it's adorable. Mrs. Wilson dejected the compliment by raising her eyebrow in disdain. It's just a crazy whole thing, she said. I just slip it on sometimes when I don't care what I look like. But it looks wonderful on you, if you know what I mean, pursued Mrs. McKee. If Chester could only get you in that pose, I think he could make something of it. We all looked in silence as Mrs. Wilson, who removed a strand of hair from over her eyes and looked back at us with a brilliant smile. Mr. McKee regarded her intently with his head to one side, moved his hand back and forth slowly in front of his face. I should change the light, he said after a moment. I like to bring out the modeling of the features and I tried to get hold of all the back hair. I wouldn't think of changing the light, cried Mrs. McKee. I think it's, her husband said, shh. And we all looked at the subject again, whereupon Tom Buchanan yawned audibly and got to his feet. You McKees have something to drink, he said. Get some more ice and mineral water, Myrtle, before everybody goes to sleep. I told that boy about the ice. Myrtle raised her eyebrows in despair at the shiftlessness of the lower orders. These people. You have to keep after them all the time. She looked at me and laughed pointlessly. Then she flounced over to the dog, kissed it with ecstasy, and swept into the kitchen, implying that a dozen chefs awaited her orders there. I've done some nice things out on Long Island, asserted Mr. McKee. Tom looked at him blankly. Two of them we have framed downstairs. Two what? demanded Tom. Two studies, one of them I call Montauk Point, the gulls, and the other I call Montauk Point, the sea. The sister Catherine sat down, sat down beside me on the couch. Do you live down on Long Egg too? She inquired. I live at West Egg. Really? I was down there at a party about a month ago and a man named Gadsby's. Do you know him? I live next door to him. Well, they say he's a nephew or a cousin of Kaiser Willem. That's where all his money comes from. So that's rumor number one, okay? Really? She nodded. I'm scared of him. I'd hate to have him get anything on me. This absorbing information about my neighbor was interrupted by Mrs. McKee's pointing suddenly at Catherine. Chester, I think you could do something with her, she broke out. But Mr. McKee only nodded in a bored way and turned his attention to Tom. I'd like to do more work out on Long Island if I could get the entry. All I ask is that they should give me a start. Ask Myrtle, said Tom, breaking into a short shout of laughter as Mrs. Wilson entered with a tray. She'll give you a letter of introduction, won't you, Myrtle? Do what? <laughs> she asked, startled. You'll give McKee a letter of introduction to your husband so he can do some studies of him. His lips moved silently for a moment as he invented George B. Wilson at the gasoline pump or something like that. Catherine leaned close to me and whispered in my ear. Neither of them can stand the person they're married to. Can't they? Can't stand them. She looked at Myrtle and then at Tom. What I say is, why go on living with them if they can't stand each if they can't stand them? If I was them, I'd get a divorce and get married to each other right away. She doesn't like Wilson either? The answer to this was unexpected. It came from Myrtle, who had overheard the question, and it was violent and obscene. You see, said Catherine triumphantly. She lowered her voice again. It's really his wife that's keeping them apart. She's a Catholic, and they don't believe in divorce. Daisy was not a Catholic, and I was a little shocked at the elaborateness of the lie. When they do get married, continued Catherine, they're going west to live for a while until it blows over. It'd be more discreet to go to Europe. Oh, do you like Europe? She exclaimed surprisingly. I just got back from Monte Carlo. Really? Just last year, I went over there with another girl. 
stay long? No, we just went to Monte Carlo and back. We went by way of Marseille. We had over $1,200 when we started, but we got gypped out of all of it in two days in the private rooms. We had an awful time getting back. I could tell you, God, how I hated that town. So Catherine, I'm not really sure about the character of Catherine. She lives in a hotel with a friend and um, she travels and loses money and gambles and does all sorts of things that would be considered really inappropriate, especially for a woman at this time. Um, and part of me thinks that she might also be a prostitute, but um, I'll find somewhere out for you guys and let you know. The late afternoon sky bloomed in the window for a moment, like the blue honey of the Mediterranean. Then the shrill voice of Mrs. McKee called me back into the room. I almost made a mistake too, she declared vigorously. I almost married a little kike who'd been after me for years. I knew he was below me. Everybody kept saying to me, Lucille, that man's way below you. But if I hadn't met Chester here, he'd have sure, he'd have got me sure. Yeah, but listen, said Myrtle Wilson, nodding her head up and down. At least you didn't marry him. I know I didn't. Well, I married him, said Myrtle, ambiguously. And that's the difference between your case and mine. Why did you, Myrtle? demanded Catherine. Nobody forced you to, Myrtle considered. I married him because I thought he was a gentleman, she said finally. I thought he knew something about breeding, but he wasn't fit to lick my shoe. You were crazy about him for a while, said Catherine. Crazy about him, cried Myrtle incredulously. Who said I was crazy about him? I was never any more crazy about him than I am that man there. She pointed at, she pointed suddenly at me and everyone looked at me accusingly. I tried to show by my expression that I had played no part in her past. The only crazy I was when I married him. I knew right away I'd made a mistake. He borrowed somebody's best suit to get married in and never even told me about it. And the man came after it one day when he was out. She looked around to see who was listening. Oh, is that your suit? I said, this is the first I ever heard about it, but I gave it to him. And then I laid down and cried to beat the band all afternoon. She really ought to get away from him, resumed Catherine to me. They've been living over that garage for 11 years and Tom's the first sweetie she ever had. The bottle of whiskey, a second one, was now in constant demand by all present, excepting Catherine, who felt just as good on nothing at all. Tom rang for the janitor and sent him for some celebrated sandwiches, which were a complete supper in themselves. I wanted to get out and walk eastward toward the park through the soft twilight, but each time I tried to go, I became entangled in some wild, strident argument which pulled me back, as if with ropes into my chair. Yet high over the city, our line of yellow windows must have contributed their share of human secrecy to the casual watcher in the darkening streets. And I was him too, looking up and wondering. I was within and without simultaneously enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. So he's looking around at all these like really densely populated apartment buildings and they're all kind of like each window tells us a bit of a story. Myrtle pulled her chair close to mine and suddenly let her warm and suddenly her warm breath poured over me the story of her first meeting with Tom. It was on the two little seats facing each other that are always the last ones left on the train. I was going up to New York to see my sister and spend the night. He had on a dress suit and patent leather shoes and I couldn't keep my eyes off him. But every time he looked at me, I had to pretend to be looking at the advertisement over my head. When we came to the station, he was next to me in his white shirt front pressed against my arm. And so I told him I'd have to call a policeman, but he knew I lied. I was so excited that when I got into a taxi with him, I didn't hardly know I, I wasn't getting into a subway train. All I kept thinking about over and over was, you can't live forever, you can't live forever. She turned to Mrs. McKee in the room, rang full of her artificial laughter. <laughs> My dear, she cried, I'm going to give you this dress as soon as I'm through with it. I've got to get another one tomorrow. I'm going to make a list of all the things I've got to get. A massage and a wave and a collar for the dog and one of those cute little 
ashtrays when you touch with a spring and a wreath with a black silk bow from Mother's Grave that'll last all summer. I've got to write down a list so I won't forget all the things I got to do. It was nine o'clock. Almost immediately afterward, I looked at my watch and found it was 10. Mr. McKee was asleep on a chair with his fist clenched in his lap, like a photograph of a man of action. Taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheek the remains of a spot of dried lather that had worried me all the afternoon. The little dog was sitting on the table looking with blind eyes through the smoke and from time to time groaning faintly. People disappeared, reappeared, made plans to go somewhere and then lost each other, searched for each other, found each other a few feet, feet away. Sometime toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Mrs. Wilson stood face to face, discussing in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. Daisy, 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 shouted Mrs. Wilson. I'll say it whenever I want. Daisy, Day. Making a short, deft movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. Then there were bloody towels upon the bathroom floor and women's voices scolding and high over the confusion, a long broken wail of pain. Mr. McKee awoke from his doze and started in a daze toward the door. When he had gone halfway, he turned around and stared at the scene. His wife and Catherine scolding and consoling as they stumbled here and there among the crowd of furniture with articles of aid. And the despairing figure on the couch bleeding fluently and trying to spread a copy of Town Tattle over the tapestry scenes of Versailles. Then Mr. McKee turned and continued on out the door. Taking my hat from the chandelier, I followed. Come to lunch someday, he suggested as we groaned down in the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands off the lever, snapped the elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agreed. I'd be glad to. Da, da, da. I was standing beside his bed and he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear with a great portfolio in his hands. Beauty and the Beast, Loneliness, Old Grocery Horse, Broken Bridge. Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lower level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the morning Tribune and waiting for the four o'clock train. So chapter two is um, a very rowdy house party. Um, some drunken debauchery that ends with Tom Buchanan breaking his mistress, Myrtle Wilson's nose for saying his wife's name. So obviously Tom has um, drawn the line there for Myrtle. Um, so Myrtle is vulgar. Okay, she's loud and the whole living room of this apartment is loud and um, my grandma would say all her taste is in her mouth. So she's got everything like piled, piled and piled and piled on in this apartment and on her physically and she's into the whiskeys and um, it gets really out of hand. And Tom's answer to her is to break her nose. So you also see the character of Tom um, and his violence towards women. Um, in the end of chapter two, though, an interesting thing happens. So Mr. McKee, the photographer, the artistic photographer, um, invites Nick Carraway to lunch. So I want you guys to think about this. There's an invitation an acceptance, the time elapsing, so the ellipses, and then all of a sudden they are um, together in his bedroom between the sheets, clad in underwear. So why does F. Scott Fitzgerald allude to something between Mr. McKee and Nick? So there's this like unmentioned thing but obviously something goes on here. Um, so I just want you to think about the shock value of that um, and trying to tell the story of 1922 um, in 1925, right? So F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald alluding to this homosexual act between Mr. McKee and Nick, um, 
maybe gives you some more insight into the character of Nick. There's tons that you can read into this if you look online. Um, tons of people have many, there are many, many theories, literary theories about what was done here. But I want you to know that this was a trend setting um, text in that way. Okay, so by making reference to, um, they couldn't directly say what happens, but by letting you kind of paint the picture, um, you can get what's going on here. So when we get into chapter three, chapter three is also a party, but it's not a boring dinner party. It's not um, the over the top, booze fast in the living room of Moidel, Moidel Wilson. It is an elegant, beautiful, um, very lavish and expensive party at Jay Gatsby's. Okay, so um, I hope you enjoyed and we will continue on with uh, some chapter two information and carry on to chapter three.